Hello everybody, just before we begin, I just want to say about the sound quality, if it seems a bit off or a bit weird, it's because I am starting to build an actual like proper studio with foam in the walls and all that shit. Unfortunately, I started, um, <laughs> I took apart my existing studio thing that I had like dampening like blankets and stuff like this set up and I started constructing this with the foam and covering the walls with foam, basically, like an insane as asylum, which is pretty accurate. Then um, when I <laughs> I got through it, and then I realised that they'd only sent the one box of the foam I'd ordered, so I've got half of it done. Um, so I'm sat here in a half-constructed room. So that's why there's a sound issue, if you think there is, um, and I think there probably is, but I don't know. It's probably okay. I've done my best. Um, I wanted to get this video done and uh, out, so I've just recorded it in my current situation because the other, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't change it after the fact. Basically, sorry, I'm halfway constructed, but it should be done in a few days. So should see an improvement by then across the board. Improvements in sound quality. So uh, yeah, sorry about that, and uh, hope you enjoy the video. Warp stars by Ian Watson. On Jummy Jabal's 16th birthday, he watched a witch being broken in the market square of Groxgelt. The time was the cool of the evening. The harsh blue sun had set a while since. However, the night, with its star lanterns, was a couple of hours away as yet. The saffron-hued gas giant still bulged hugely in the wispy sky, shouldering high above the horizon like some mountainous desert dune. Its light gilded the tiled roofs of the town and the dusty, hoof-printed street. That golden giant in the sky seemed to be such a furnace, such a molten crucible, yet unlike the sun, it dispensed no heat. Jummy wondered how that could be, but he knew better than to ask. When he was younger, a few whippings had deterred him from excessive curiosity. His past punishment had been well intended. Boys and girls who questioned were perhaps on the road to becoming witches themselves. A trumpet would sound from the watchtower, after the golden giant did finally sink out of sight. That braying screech signalled the curfew at the onset of darkness. Thereafter, mutants were said to prowl the black streets. Did mutants really roam Groxgeld by night? Hunting for victims, seeking entry into homes of the unwise. It struck Jomi as a convenient arrangement that the townsfolk were thus exiled to their homes during the cooler hours. Otherwise the taverns of the Groxgeld might well have remained open longer. Workmen might have caroused till late, and thus be tired when the dawn came grumpy and lethargic at their labours during the hot day. Oh, but mutants certainly did exist, without a doubt. Witches. Houdinists. Here was yet another, bound upon the wheel. Two hours till darkness. This witch here uses a cunning trick, Reverend Hemrick Farb, the preacher, proclaimed to the crowd from the ebon steps of the headman's residence. He can hex time itself. He can stop the flow of the time stream, though not for very long. So do not run away in fear. Witness his punishment and mark my words. The witch looks human, but in truth he is distorted. Beware of those who seem human yet are not. Farb was a fat fellow. Beneath his black cloak, leather armour bulged in a manner that... Had he been a woman, might have been described as voluptuous. Womanly, too, was the jade perfume vial, dangling from one pierced nostril, intercepting the odours of manure and of bodies on which sweat had barely dried. The tattoo of a chained, burning demon, caged within the hex symbol, writhed about one chubby cheek while he spoke, guarding his mouth and porcine eyes from contamination. Usually, the preacher wore loose black silks on account of the heat, which was only now draining away. For combat with evil, though, he must needs be suitably protected. A holstered stub gun hung from the amulet-studded belt around his rotund waist. Horses snickered and stamped. Men patted their long knives for comfort, and the few who owned such, their rune-daubed muskets. Destroy the deviant! shouted one fervent voice, 
Break the unhuman, cried another. Kill the witch. Fab eyed the brawny, half-naked executioner, who stood beside the wheel, gripping a cudgel. As usual, the agent of retribution had been chosen by lot. Most townsfolk might sport wens, carbuncles, and other blemishes of their burnt skin, but few were feeble. Even if so, a puny executioner would still take the longer to perform his task, to the tune of jeers and mocking jeers. I, declared Fab, I warn you that this witch will try to slow down his punishment, stretching it out until nightfall in the vain hope of rescue. Spittle flew from the preacher's lips, as if he was one of those mutants who could spit poison. Such a mutant had been rooted out a few months earlier, gagged and broken in this self-same square. The front ranks of Fab's audience pressed closer to the ebon steps, as if a drop of spray from the preacher's lips might keep their vision clear, their humanity intact. Fab turned to the standard of the emperor, which flanked him. The townswomen had painstakingly embroidered in precious wires, an image copied from the preacher's missal. When Fab genuflected, his audience hastily bent their knees. God Emperor, chanted the preacher, mow our source of security, protect us from foul demons, guard the wombs of our women, that we mites are not twisted into mutants. Save from the darkness within darkness. Oh, watch over us as we carry out your will. Imperator harmonium, nostra salvatio. Sacred words, those last. Powerful hex words. Fab snorted through one nostril, spat saliva at the crowd. Johnny gazed at the standard. That age-old imperial face was a mask of wires and tubes, which the metallic embroidery persuasively evoked. Begin! shouted Fab. The wheel, which was powered by a massive, firmly wound spring, started to turn. It carried the witch around, his limbs bent into a half loop. The executioner raised his club. Nothing happened. The wheel stood still. The stalwart was frozen. Though forewarned, the crowd groaned. The spectators were outside the small zone of hoodooed time cast by the doomed witch. They could still move about, yet hardly a body moved. At this moment, Fab explained, the witch may well be calling out with his mind to some vile demon, leading it here, showing the way to Groxgelt. Jommy wondered whether that was true. If so, why not slay the witch speedily with a knife as soon as they were captured? Maybe the preacher relished the ceremony for its own sake. Certainly such a spectacle riveted the crowd and dramatised their deepest fears. Otherwise people might grow careless, no? They might fail to report suspicions of mutants in their midst. A mother could try to protect a child of hers, who only seemed slightly twisted. Though... Wouldn't the permanent presence of the wheel in the market square put such fear into hoodinists that they would try their utmost to hide their witching ways and not betray themselves? Jommy puzzled about this. The timeless moment ended. As the delayed cudgel descended crackingly, the witch screamed. Time paused once again in his immediate vicinity. Presently another blow fell, crushing flesh and snapping bone. Due to his futile evasions, the witch did indeed take much longer to be broken, and would take longer to hang draped around the wheel, slowly dying in utter pain. Oh, what else could the witch... Though, what else could the wretch have done? Praise the emperor who protects, cried the paunchy preacher. Lord Eight, Imperiatorum. His leather-clad breasts and belly quaked. He panted as he sniffed perfume, blood, excrement, and sweat. Each time that a new blow fell, Jummy felt a fierce itch at a different location inside the marrow of his own bones, as if he was experiencing a hint of that excruciating punishment through the filter of a pile of pillows. He wriggled and scratched uselessly.
Over the course of the next year, a dozen more witches and muties died in the square of Groxgelt. A few of the more vocal townsfolk began to ask in their cups whether there could be some sickness unique to the human seed, which did not plague beast kind. Mares did not give birth to fowls, which developed strange powers as they matured, did they now? Jummy's father, who was a tanner of lizard heights, discouraged any such speculation under his own roof, and Jummy had long since learned to hold his tongue. Preacher Fab encouraged the townsfolk, as well as terrifying them. He promised that the Emperor would not let his people drift into chaos. On Jummy's seventeenth birthday, he dreamt the first dream. It seemed that a meth was shaping itself inside his brain. It was forming from out of the very substance of the grey matter within his skull. In his dreams, he knew that this was so. If only he could turn his dream eye backwards, he would see the lips deep within his cranium and, between them, the lolloping tongue that was responsible for the soup-sucking sounds he heard in his sleep. Terror gripped him in the dream. Somehow he couldn't awaken till those internal lips had finished their slobbery mumblings and shut up. Over the course of the next several nights, those interior sounds came more closely to resemble words. As yet these words were too blurred to understand, but they seemed to be coming clearer, almost as if adjusting themselves to the words that Jommy knew. Jommy shared a pokey garret room with his elder brother, Big Ven. Naturally, he did not inquire whether Ven dreamed of a similar voice, nor whether Ven ever woke in the wee hours and thought that he had heard a whisper coming from within Jommy's brain. Always the wheel stood in the marketplace as a warning. Jommy sweated as he slumbered. His straw palace was damp each morning. Am I becoming unhuman? He asked himself anxiously. Maybe he was only experiencing nightmares. He dismissed any notion of consulting Reverend Fab. Instead, he prayed fervently to the Emperor to dismiss the mumblings from his mind. Each blue dawn, along with a band of fellow labourers, Jommy walked out of the town to the Grock's breeding station and farm. Stripped to his loincloth and charm necklace, he toiled in an annex of a slaughter shed, sorting offal. You're lucky! The short, sturdy mother often told him. Such a soft job at your age. This was true. The big reptiles were notoriously vicious. If they had not provided meat that was delicious to eat and highly nourishing, and if they had not been so well able to nourish themselves on any rubbish tossed their way, even soil, any sane person would have steered well clear of them. Although the breeding specimens were kept sedated with chemicals, a beast might still go berserk. When penned alongside its fellows, that was the natural inclination of a grox. The meat stock were lobotomized. When being driven to the slaughter, even these brain-cut brutes could prove fractious. Any grox herdsman or butcher could lose a finger or an eye, even his life. Virtually all bore disfiguring scars. The rulers in Erpol, the capital city an unimaginable hundred kilometres away, demanded an endless supply of grox meat for their own consumption and for profitable export. Refrigerated robot floaters carried the meat to Erpol. You're well favoured, Jommy's mother had also told him, more than once. This was true too. Jommy was clean-limbed and clean-featured, unblemished by the cysts and warts which afflicted most of the population. It was the farmer's wife, Tubby Galendra Pushik, who had assigned Jommy his cushy billet. Madame Pushik would often wander through the offal shed to ogle Jommy, slicked with blood and sweat. Especially, she would loiter by the farm pond to leer at him when he was washing off after a day's work. Oh yes, she had her eye on him, but she was too scared of her bullying husband to do more than look. Jommy had his own eye set wistfully on Pushik's daughter, Gretchi, a slim beauty. Gretchi wore a broad straw hat and carried a parasol to shade herself from the bright blue sunlight. She turned up her pert nose at most of the town's youth, though she favoured Jommy with a smile when her mother wasn't watching. 
and then his heart would beat fast. From occasional words he and she exchanged, he knew that Gretchy's sights were set upon becoming mistress to one of the lordly rulers in Erpol, but maybe she might care to practice with him first. That day, while Jummy sorted grocks livers, kidneys and hearts, the mouth within his brain began to speak to him clearly, caressingly. Be calm, it cooed. Don't fear me. I can teach you much you need in order to survive, and to gratify your young desires. I to survive, for you are different, are you not? What are you? Jummy thought fiercely, and even then he resisted the impulse to speak out loud and risk being overheard by a fellow worker. Was the languid voice male, or was it female? Perhaps neither. What are you, voice? Before you can understand the answer, you need to learn much. Tell me, what shape has your world? Shape? Why, it's all sort of shapes. It's smooth and rocky. It's up and down. Seen from afar, Jommy. Seen from afar so that the hills and valleys are as nothing. Seen by a bird flying higher than any bird has ever flown. I guess like a plate. Oh, no. Listen, Jommy. Your world is globular like an eyeball. Your world is a big moon that swings around a giant world wholly made of gas, which is an even bigger eyeball. Your blue sun is the hugest eyeball hereabouts. How can that be? The sun's so much smaller than the giant. But hotter, hmm? Have you ever wondered why it's hotter? Sure I have. But you thought it wise not to ask, hmm? Wise, Jummy. Wise. How the voice fondled him. You can ask me without fear. Your sun is so vast that its own weight burns it. It's a star, and so far away that it looks like a thumbnail at arm's length. As I myself am far from you, my Jommy. The voice seemed to sigh. Indeed. Much further than your star. Jummy continued, sorting the slippery, reeking entrails into different trays. It can't be a star. The star lanterns are tiny and cold. Ah, innocent youth, the stars aren't lanterns. Let's take this step by step, shall we? Your moon and your sun and the stars are all spherical in shape. Spherical? What words this voice knew, such as the lords in Uppal might use? Circular. Think loudly of a circle floating in empty space. I'd rather not. The circle was the shape of a wheel. The terrible taboo wheel. No men must make any wheel, nor use any save for the punishment wheel, or else witches would triumph and rule the world. Calm yourself, sweet youth. The wheel is the beginning of knowledge. I will tell you why if you will concentrate on imagining a wheel. That helps me to focus on you. Focus? To see you, as through a lens. What's a lens? Ah, you have so much to learn, and I will be your secret teacher. When Jommy washed himself later, Galandra Pushik stood with hands on giant hips surveying him, as if he was the next day's dinner. And to his horror, he overheard her thoughts. She lusted to run her meaty hands all over Jommy. She yearned to knead him like dough, then bake him like bread in her hot embrace. Farmer Pushik would be going on a business trip away from the farm some day soonish. Then she would enjoy the boy. Jommy could hear thoughts. It was as if the voice in his head was massaging muscles of his brain that had been puny as threads until now, was tickling sensation into nerves of his mind that had previously lain loose, causing them to knot and knit. He could hear thoughts. Therefore, he was a witch. Be tranquil, the voice advised, yet think loudly of the circle. Thus I can find you, 
Thus I can save you, my bewitching boy. For many days the voice told Johnny about the pleasures and beauties of the wider universe beyond his farming moon, where there was only toil and sweat and fear. The delights and glories that the voice described seemed somehow like memories of memories, echoes of echoes, as if the experiences in question had occurred too many years ago to count, and the voice no longer quite understood their nature, yet felt compelled to recount them even so. In the cabin of the space cruiser Human Loyalty, Inquisitor Tork Sir Pillion brooded upon the paradox which had begun to haunt him. He keyed his coded diorum and spoke to it. It is a week since we emerged safely from warp space, Benedicio Imperiatorum. We are in orbit around the gas giant Delta Comeni V. Beyond the quarterfoil tracery of the viewport, the huge orange ball of storming hydrogen and methane held on an invisible leash the crescent of a single large moon that gleamed with atmosphere. Proper storium, for millennia past, our undying emperor has defended humanity against psychic attack from the warp, so that, one far-off day, humankind can evolve psychic powers poisoned enough to protect itself. Battle banners hung from ochreous plastil walls which were the hue of dried blood. Bleached alien skulls and captured armour were mounted as trophies. For this was a ship of the Legionis Astartes, the Space Marines. Yet aliens as such rarely worried Sir Pillion. Even the most devious of aliens were, after all, natural creatures born and bred in the same universe as humankind. Aliens were as nothing compared with the terrible parasites that dwelled in the warp. On Sir Pillion's homeworld, a certain unpleasant wasp would inject its hooked eggs into the flesh of beasts and men. Warp parasites could lay their equivalent eggs in human minds. Those eggs would hatch into entities that controlled the body, consuming it and using it to spread contamination. Other warp creatures could seize human souls and drag them back into darkness to feast upon, slowly. And there were far mightier demonic entities too. Psycho witches were beacons, shining into the warp. They attracted parasites and demons that could lay waste a world and make its people unhuman. Sub propus setum. Wild, unguided, wayward psychers must be sought out by our inquisition and destroyed. Counter propus sotium. So as to nourish our emperor, hundreds of fresh young psychers must daily sacrifice their souls. I gladly, too, to feed his own huge, anguished soul. Yes, indeed. Emerging psychers were sought out avidly and sent to earth by the shipload. Those of high calibre, who could be trained to serve the Imperium, were soul-bound to the Emperor for their own protection, an agonising ritual which generally left them blind. Exceptional individuals, such as Sarpillion, were allowed to guard themselves mentally. The cream of such free psychers became inquisitors, yet daily hundreds of those transportees to earth, duly guided in the blessings of sacrifice, were yielding up their lives in the sucking gullet of the God Emperor's mind, and elsewhere, throughout the galaxy, untamable psychers were being exterminated as witches. Paradoxes. We root out as weeds what we cannot harvest, yet whether we harvest or root out, the new crop is largely crushed, in so far as is within our power. How then can humankind evolve that independent future strength it so desperately needs. Sir Pillion imagined a meadow of grass being trampled repeatedly for millennia. He visualised new green blades struggling up into the light, only to be flattened remorselessly lest they feed the malevolent creatures of the warp. Would the Emperor eventually relax his crushing pressure by permitting himself to die? thus allowing the grass suddenly to sprout up straight and tall and strong, a crop of superhumans. Yet until that wonderful epoch, utter repression. Let me not become a heretic, murmured Sir Pillion. I must not. On reflection, he erased the last entry.
During Sir Pillian's career, he had encountered situations sufficient to persuade him of the Emperor's wisdom. He had been a party to enough acts of harshness, had been the initiator of such deeds of necessary savagery, most recently at Valhal II, where enslavers had been invading from the warp and instigating a fierce insurrection against the Imperium. The universe, he told his diarum, is cruel, savage, and forgiving, a battleground, and the darkest enemies hide in the warp like tigers, ever ready to pounce on the human herd. If one of that herd attracts the notice of a tiger, the rest of the herd may be ravaged, or worse, possessed and twisted obscenely into evil. Was not Sarpillion himself thus forced at times to act like a beast, presiding over atrocities in the service of a tyrant? Sarpillion did not exactly pride himself on his independence of thought. He rather regretted such intrusions of doubt. Still, and all, these qualities produced a certain flexibility and ingenuity thus best serving the cause of the Emperor and of the human race. His attire reflected that independent demeanour. He wore a long kilt of silver fur, an iridescent cuirass suggestive of the shell of a giant exotic beetle, and a blood-red cloak with a high collar. On both forefingers he wore rare Jacaro digital weapons, one of these a miniaturised needler, the other a tiny las pistol. Orthodox guns were always secreted about his person. Amulets jangled around his neck, making exorcistic music as he moved. Sapillion was tall, dark, and lean. His drooping black moustache resembled some insect's mandibles. On his right cheek was the tattoo of an ever-watchful eye. Long before the cabin door opened to admit Commander Hackard, Sapillion expected his arrival. The Inquisitor was a powerful censor of presence, who knew where everyone was within a generous radius. An unusual offshoot of this sense allowed him to anticipate intrusions from the warp. That was why human loyalty had come to Delta Comini solar system. Shortly after leaving Valhal too, Sapillion had dreamed of a sickly sweet, coaxing voice that was neither man's nor woman's, cajoling a bright young mind far, far away. And that young mind was special, in a way that the young Sapillions had been special, only more so, much more so, it seemed. Thus, even across the light years, and through the immeasurable fluctuating currents of the warp sea, Sapillion heard something that resonated with his own psyche, that plucked at his instincts, as if threads of dark destiny bound him direly to that mind and to that eerie, seductive voice. The casting of the room bones by Sapillion, in tandem with a imperial tarot definition, performed by the ship's navigator, had indicated the blue star that was the fourth brightest in the constellation of Khomeini. "'We are in orbit around the parent planet,' Hackard reported respectfully, with only the merest hint of reproach, which he would hardly dare voice. "'I thought it diplomatic not to order our captain to orbit the moon itself till I had presented our compliments by Comnet to the governor.' Scar tissue on Hackard's chin stood out whitely as though he had been punched. His cheek tattoo was of a skull skewered by a dagger. His teeth were painted black as a signal that any smile of his was dark. A vermilion badge of nobility, a stylized power axe, adorned his right knee pad modestly, so that whenever bending to the emperor's image during devotions, he should kneel upon his heraldic honor. His gloved hand strayed to the imperial eagle emblazoned in purple on his lavender dress cuirass, as if to emphasise his unquestioning loyalty. Sapillion knew that the commander would far rather have returned to the grief-bringer's base, after the action on Valhal too, to take their dead home and to renew their strength. Even grief-bringer marines had been hard put to quash the enslaver disorder. Losses had been heavy. Only three platoons of the warriors remained. Perhaps the Valhal mission 
should best have been entrusted to one of the redoubtable Terminator teams, but none had been available. Truly, the resources of the Imperium were stretched thin. En route to Delta Khomeini, during a refueling stopover at a high-gravity world, Sapillion had commandeered the services of two platoons of Ogryn giants as a fighting supplement, also of a lone tech priest, for the Griefbringers had lost their tech magus on Valhal too. It was an uneasy mixture. Yes, that's sensible, Commander, said the Inquisitor. And have you presented my compliments yet? Thus did Sapillion emphasise his personal authority, at a time when he nevertheless felt beset by doubts. That I have, my Lord Inquisitor. Governor Valakot felt obliged to mention that he maintained adequate planetary forces in case of alien attack, and that preachers on that moon root out any psychers fiercely. Would you describe him as an independent-minded governor? Not obstructively so. We are welcome to land and investigate. Just as well for him. He suggested that we wouldn't need too many space marines to cope with a moon full of farmers, where there isn't even an obvious threat. Sapillion snorted. The level of threat is for me to decide. The worst threat is often the threat that hides itself. The governor suggested, most politely, you understand, that it might be beneath our dignity to blow human rabbits to pieces. I wonder whether he has any inkling that our strength is depleted. Perhaps his court, Astropath, somehow eavesdropped on ours, though I rather doubt it. I suspect he has some guilty reason to fear for his dynasty. Such as irregularities in imperial taxes? The Velikots control the finest Grox farms in this celestial segment. Much of the meat and other produce goes to Delta Khomeini too. That's a barren mining world, producing rare metals for our Imperium. Perhaps there are secret financial arrangements. Which are none of our concern. I implied as much without saying so. Ah, a marine commander needs many skills, does he not? My thank you, my Lord Inquisitor. Sapillion felt obliged to ask, How goes morale? For the Griefbringers had lost their chaplain in action on Valhal too. Hackard hesitated. Be frank, I will not be offended. The Ogrins. They stink. Sapillion attempted an injection of humour. They are famous for stinking. If one cannot tolerate some body odour, how can one bear the stench of scorching flesh in combat? My men will fight alongside the Ab humans with honour, but they don't like it much, having to share a ship with those stenches, I suppose, my Lord Inquisitor. You insisted on pressing the Ogrens into service because, being Ab human and, frankly, thuggish, they're more expendable. Sapillion winced momentarily. What Hackard implied was perilously close to unthinkable impertinence. Yet Sapillion had invited the commander to be outspoken, had he not? The loss of so many brave fighters in the earlier action, however justifiable, was a slight blot on the Inquisitor's person or escuchon of honour. Marines would willingly sacrifice their lives. They were not, however, suicide berserkers. To replace them with expendable abhumans somewhat smeared the pride of the griefbringers, amounting almost to an error of judgment on Sir Pillion's part. One did not polish a fine sword with mud, nor repair a broken one with wood. Muttering a brief prayer, Sir Pillion unclipped a pouch from his belt. Breathing deeply and slowly to induce a light trance, he cast his rune bones upon a desk of polished black wood. Those fingers and toe bones, minutely inscribed with conjurations, had belonged to a rogue psyche mage, whom the Inquisition had executed five centuries earlier. Now these relics served Sir Pillion's psychic sense. They were a useful channel for his talent, a focus. As he concentrated, a pattern of white bones against black swam until a foggy picture formed, visible to him alone. "'What do you see?' whispered Hackard reverently. The thought drifted through Sir Pillion's mind, like some seductive siren song. That it wasn't totally unknown for an Inquisitor to 
sicken of its harsh duties and flee to some lost world, some primitive pastoral planet or other. Not one such as this moon, certainly. The Inquisitor resumed his breathing routine. I see a strapping, comely boy. Though his face isn't clear, I see the circle of a portal opening from the warp and coming through it is... abomination. What species of abomination? Enslavers again? A sensible question. The warp entities known as enslavers could open a gateway through the very flesh of a vulnerable psyker and spill out to do as their name suggested. Sir Pillion shook his head. The boy is being given an aura of protection now to hide him. He's somewhere within a hundred or so kilometres of the capital city. He's becoming a powerful psychic receiver. Other psychic talents are sprouting in him. I think he's about to be possessed, unless we reach him first. To capture him or destroy him? I fear for his potential power. One day, perhaps, and Sir Pillion sketched a pious obeisance. He might be a little like the Emperor himself. Just a little. Not a new Horus, surely. What loathing crept into the commander's voice as he uttered the name of the corrupted rebel battlemaster who had betrayed the Imperium and besmirched the honour of so many Space Marine chapters long, long ago. If that's the situation, maybe the relevant quadrant of the moon should be sterilised, though that would include Erpol City and the spaceport and many Grox farms. Delta Khomeini, too, would starve as a consequence, and the moon has orbital defences as well as its surface troops, who would fight us. They won't have much battle experience. I think we could do it, I think, perhaps with our last drop of blood. Let us pray it doesn't come to that, Hackard, though your zeal is commendable. What is finer than death in battle to defend the future of mankind? If we are in time, this boy must needs to be a gift to our emperor, for his own divine wisdom to judge. Let us head for that moon as soon as our present orbit permits. Sapillion uttered a silent prayer that his inner eyesight might pierce the veil that now partially hid the boy. Think of the circle, crooned the mouth within Jomi's head. It grows larger and larger, does it not? The boy watched a floater of grocks meat depart from Pushik's farm. The engine and cargo section was spattered with mystic runes to help hold the vehicle in the air and encourage the robot brain to find its way to the city. Those runes had recently been repainted. If runes faded or flaked off the hull, the floater might stray from its course, or its chiller unit might fail. Clouds of flies buzzed around a couple of sledges on which piles of scaly hides, some barrels of blood and sacks of bones were setting out for the much shorter journey to Groxgelt, there to be rendered into glue and sausages and crude armour. Whips cracked, slicing through the aerial vermin to tickle the drought horses into action. The runners creaked across stone-worn smooth by centuries of such local transport. No, thought Jommy. The floater would only break down if it hadn't been serviced properly. The meat transport it was only a machine, a thing of metal and wires and crystals, based on ancient science from the Dark Age of Technology. Courtesy of the voice, Jommy knew now that former ages had existed, unimaginable stretches of time unimaginably long ago. The current age was a time of superstition, so said the voice. An earlier age had been a time of enlightenment, yet that bygone era was now called dark, to the extent that so much had been forgotten about it. So the voice assured him, confusingly. He mustn't worry his pretty mind over much about fell demons such as Preacher Far pratted about. Such things existed, to a certain extent, that was true, but enlightenment was the route to joy. The owner of the voice said that it had been captured by the storms of warp space long ago, doomed to wander in strange domains for eons, until finally it sensed a dawning psycho-talent that was peculiarly attuned to it. 
You aren't a witch, dearest boy, the psycho had assured him. You're a psycho. Say after me. I'm a psyche with a glorious mind that deserves to relish all manner of gratifications, which I, your only true friend, will teach you how to attain. Say to yourself, I'm the most lustrous of psychers, and remember to think of the circle, won't you? The owner of the voice would come to Jommy. It would save him from the entrail shed. It would save him from the crushing embrace of fat Galendra Pushak and from the terror of the wheel. Soon, cooed the voice, like the coolest of evening breezes. Always think of the circle, like a wheel rolling ever closer to you, but not a wheel to fear. Why have we been taught to fear wheels? An inspiration assaulted Jommy. Surely our sledges would run more easily if we used a wheel on each corner. Four wheels which turn as the sledge advances. Then it would be called a wagon. You're such a bright lad, Jommy. Bright in so many ways. Of a sudden, the voice grew sour and petulant. And here comes spurious brightness to cheer you. Gretchy, her slim limbs mainly hidden by a coarse cotton frock, yet imaginable as fair and smooth, her breasts like two young doves nesting beneath the fabric, her chestnut hair hanging in ringlets, mostly veiling a slender neck, the huge straw hat shading a creamy complexion, the teasing eyes of a blue so much less daunting than the sun. How could such perfection have issued from Galandra Pushek's hips, Gretchy twirled her pink parasol coquettishly. "'Whatever are you thinking, Jamal Jabal?' she asked, as if inviting him to flatter her navely, or even vulgarly, to excite her. He swallowed. He muttered the truth. "'About science?' Gretchy pouted. "'Would that be the art of sighing for a girl, perhaps? Fine lords will sigh for me and Erpal some day soon, believe me.' Could he possibly tell her his secret? Surely she wouldn't betray him. Gretchy, if it were possible for you to go much further away than Upal. Where's further than Upal? Upal's the centre of everything hereabouts. Would you go? Surely you don't mean to some farm in the furthest hinterland. She wrinkled up her nose, pettishly. Surrounded by muties, no doubt. He pointed at the sky. No, much further away, to the stars and to other worlds. She laughed at him, though not entirely with derision. Perhaps this good-looking youth could tickle her fancy in unexpected ways. Should he whisper in her ear, arranging a rendezvous after work to hear his secret? Remember the cruel wheel, Jommy, warned the voice. When you come, voice, can I take Gretchy with me? Did he hear a faint stifled snarl in the depths of his mind. Gretchy simpered. Are you pretending to ignore me now? Are your feelings hurt? What do you know of feelings? He stared at the twin soft birds of her bosom, yearning to cup them in his hands. But his hands were soiled with blood and bile. The memory came to him of Gretchy's mother feeling Jommy assiduously in a fetid imagination, exploring and squeezing him. Then out of the corner of his eye he noticed Galandra Pushak glaring from the veranda of the farmhouse. Gretchy must have spied her mother too, for she promptly flounced away, turning up her nose as if at some foul reek. Strange, Grill the tech priest said to himself. A world that bans wheels. Strange, and many are his worlds. The priest reached inside his hood to scratch the side of his head, Sweat and the coarse material of his cowl were irritating his implant sites. Grill scanned the cavernous plastil dormitory through his dark-lensed eyes. Imperial icons gleamed, each lit by a glow globe, sharing wall space with crude battle fetishes of the giants, one of which was draped respectfully with a ram's intestines from the arrival feast the night before. 
Scraps of meat, hair, broken bones, and littered the floor, mashed into the semblance of a brown and grey carpet, on which assorted insectoid vermin grazed or lay crushed themselves. The dormitory had ceased to reek. It had transcended stench, attaining a new plane of fetter, as though the air had transmuted. Stinks did not usually perturb Grill, but he wore nostril filters. Hmm. The Ogren, Thunderjug, Agrox, quit sharpening his yellow tusks on a rasp. What's matter? Sergeant Ogren Agrox was a bonehead. He had undergone biochemical ogren neural enhancement. Thus, he was capable of a degree of sophisticated conversation. Could be trusted, with a ripper gun too. Grill, hot and uncomfortable in his heavy wool robes, surveyed the crudely tattooed Mega Man in his coarse cloth and chain armour. Several battle badges were riveted to the giant's thick skull. I suppose, said Grill, being forced to walk or ride drought horses keeps the peasants in their places, doesn't it? Seems use floaters, though, objected Thunderjug. Ah, well, you need to hurry fresh meat to the spaceport and up into orbit to be void frozen. Banning wheels seems a little harsh. I guess in this neck of the galaxy the wheel represents the beginning of dangerous thoughts. These musings were, of course, too complicated for the bonehead Ogren to follow. The giant plucked a thumb-sized louse from his armpit and crunched the grey parasite speculatively between his teeth. Just then, Ogren voices bellowed. Two warriors had bared their tusks, seizing mace and axe, respectively. They began to hack at one another's chainmail in a bellicose competition. Spectators roared wagers in favour of one combatant or the other, or both, stamping their great feet so that the steel dormitory rocked and groaned. Thunderjug lowered his head and charged along the dormitory. He butted left, he butted right, with his steel-plated skull. The querulers resisted, butting back at their sergeant, though not disrespectful enough to raise axe or mace against him. Finally, Thunderjug seized the two by the neck and crashed their heads together, in the manner of two wrecking balls, till the fighters subsided and agreed to behave. Shut up, fool! After issuing that command, Thunderjug ambled back, spat out a broken tooth and grinned. Go keep order, don't I? Grill removed his fingers from his ears. Would he have been happier billeted with the more human griefbringers? Undoubtedly more comfortable less liable to be squashed by a reeling heavyweight. On the other hand, he had come to count on Thunderjug as something of a friend, a brainy bull among this herd of buffaloes. Grill hadn't too much experience of space marines. There weren't all that many in the galaxy, but they seemed a shade cliquish. Exemplary fellows, needless to say, but so devoutly dedicated to the traditions of their chapters. From whichever angle... The galaxy was a fairly menacing sprawl of mayhem. Grill decided to strip and clean his bolt gun, muttering prayer chants under his breath all the while. You were born under warp stars, Jommy, sighed the voice. Once the warp seemed merely to be a zone through which our ships flew faster than light. Oh, we were innocent then, in spite of all our science. Naive and callow as lambs, such as your sweet self. Jummy shifted uneasily. Of late, a cloying stickiness had begun to creep into the accents of the voice at times. As if his informant realised this, its tone grew crisper. But then, all over the galaxy that we had guilelessly populated, psychers such as yourselves started to be born. So there weren't always psychers around. By no means to such an extent. When the powers and predators of chaos took heed of those bright beacons, they spilled into reality to ravage and warp the worlds. Those powers are what Preacher Fab calls demons, as it were. Then he's right in that respect. You said I shouldn't worry my head about demons. Your sweet head. Your poor son mind. 
From the low scrubby hillside, Jummy stared towards the huddle of Groxgelt. At this hour, the south pole of the gas giant seemed almost to rest upon the headman's mansion and the imperial temple as though that golden ball would crush and melt the biggest buildings that Jomi knew. The sun's blue radiance ached. Due to a trick of light and wispy clouds, a bilious greenish miasma, the colour of nausea, seemed to drip from one limb of the hostile parent world upon the town. A scrack flew overhead, seeking little lizards to dive upon, and Jomi sat very still, until the unpleasant avian discharged a tiny bomb of acidic excrement elsewhere. Ah, comely youth, guard your skin, came the voice, which could spy through his eyes. Does chaos make our sun breed wens and carbuncles on our flesh? Jomi asked. Oh, no. Your son is rich in rays beyond violet. You've been fortunate to resist those rays yourself. You'll be even luckier when I reach you. How does Gretchy know to wear a wide hat and carry a parasol? Vanity! Does she have an extra sense to tell her? If so, she needs it. In other respects, she appears senselessly empty-headed. How can you say so? She's so beautiful. And presently she will sell what you call beauty, but only as a minion and a toy, only till she withers. Beauty must mean something, protested Jommy. I mean, if I'm fair and I'm a psyker, isn't there a connection, voice? From far away, Jommy seemed to hear a stifled cackle of laughter. So you subscribe to the theory that the body and the soul reflect one another, Every irony coloured the reply. In a dark sense, that's often true. Should chaos seize a victim, that victim's body will twist and warp, if body there be. How can a person not have a body? Maybe one day you will learn how the spirit can soar free from flesh. Was the voice telling him the truth? And how could that be the road to ecstasy, whatever ecstasy really signified? As if agitated, the voice began to ramble. I was one of the earliest psychers back in the epoch when true science gave way to strife and anarchy. Of oh, the madness, the madness. I was marooned. Our ship malfunctioned. It died in the warp. All through the dark eon since, I've heard the whisperings of telepaths from the real universe. I've eavesdropped on the downfall of civilization and on its grim and terrible, ignorant revival. I could never escape. I lacked a beacon that cast a suitable light. How long do eons last? Jommy still had very little idea. For a period, there was silence. Then the voice answered, vaguely. Time behaves differently within the warp. Has your body been warped at all? asked Jommy. Again that distant cackle. My body, the voice repeated flatly. My body. It said no more than that. Phantom gangrene dribbled from the gas giant. Sapillion prayed. In nomine imperatoris, guide us to the golden boy that we may prison him or rend him or render him unto you as you wish. Imperator, guide our armour and our gaze. Lubricate our projectile weapons that they do not jam. Bless and brighten the beams of our lasers. Fear it looks in tenebris. And cleanse my vision too, he thought. Pierce that aura of protection which cloaks the boy. And tear away any cataract of doubt. The depleted ranks of grief-bringers knelt cumbersomely in their bulging, burnished, insignia-emblazoned power armour, which was principally a dark pea-green, with ingrained chevrons of headachy purple. Visors raised, they gazed intently at the Inquisitor who wore borrowed vestments of the slain chaplain. Green chusable, purple apron filigreed with the emblem of the chapter. The long mauve stole, dangling from Sir Pillion's neck to his knees, was embroidered with aliens in torments, 
amulets and icons chinked and clinked. I have decided I shall bless our Ogrim warriors too, Sapilia murmured to Hakard, who knelt beside him. Ogrins are men too, after a fashion. A blessing does not depend on the receiver, but on the giver. Does a Laz pistol possess a brain, Commander? A spirit, yes, but a thinking brain? Ogrins have spirits. Thus, at this sacred moment, did he condone his decision to dilute the strong wine of the marines with the crude ale of the barbarian giants. Sapillion could guess what the commander might be thinking. Not on my ship, they don't have spirits. A few bucketfuls to drink, and the place would be wrecked. Or maybe that was only Sapillion's own guilt speaking to him, that he, a survivor, should be wearing the vestments of a chaplain who had fought the enslavers so fiercely. The assembled Griefbringer's eyes shone with pious dedication, all this to hunt for one boy. Sir Pillion's instinct still told him that this mission mattered deeply, if only his vision was clearer. The very veiling of his insight suggested that he and the Space Marines faced a powerful adversary, and might win a great reward. To Hackard, he whispered, Ogrins and Space Marines must be as one body under your command. The former are not simply battering rams. If I do not bless them, we all fail in reverence. Would the Griefbringer's slain chaplain have blessed the loyal stout stenches too? Hakkar twitched, but of course made no objection. Benedictio! Sapillion called out loudly. Benedictionaries! Triumphus! Let your watchword for this mission be Emperor of All! Emperor of all. The grief bringers chorused in response. As Sir Pillion quit the assembly area, he vowed to redouble his exertions to sense the ambiguous presence of the boy. His rune bones continued to thwart him, almost as if in conspiracy with the power that was aiming itself at the boy. Almost as though those bones were enacting a five hundred year delayed vengeance upon the Inquisition, which had stripped the flesh from them. Very well. He must dispense with their aid. He must use sheer mental discipline. He must attempt to put himself into the boy's frame of thought, for there was a link of destiny between himself and his quarry, was there not? He must detect the boy by that ploy. He must forget all that he himself knew of the Imperium. He must erase all that he knew of the arcane wisdom of the Inquisition, garnered over millennia of terrible experiences and steadfast purity, and, in Sir Pillion's case, some decades of duty. He must imagine himself born on a farming moon. He must visualise his brain coming into bloom with bizarre petals, unseen by his fellow peasants, petals that served as esoteric psychic radar dishes, with unfurling stamens acting as antennae of the mind, each of these stamens tipped with pollen that could prove tasty to a demon or a predator. He mustn't ask himself, where precisely is this flower growing? Instead, he must ask, how is this flower feeling right now? He must identify with what he would pluck and present to the emperor. He must imitate his prey. By that expedient, he might dispel the psychic mist. Why, if he concentrated sufficiently well on pretending to be such a boy, he might even distract whatever malign force was homing in as though a heat-seeking missile were presented with a glowing decoy. But first, Sapillion had paused deep in thought, in a corridor braced with mighty ribs and muscled with black power cables. Now he strode onward to the Ogrin dormitory. He ignored the stink, which was really no worse than the odour of many burst bowels, so he told himself. He disregarded the vermin underfoot, which were really akin to diminutive edible pets. Benedictio hominis gigantes, he cried out. Shut up, Ogrins, bellowed the bonehead sergeant, snapping to attention. As Sir Pillion rattled through his litany of blessings and invocations, all he received from the bulk of his congregation by way of responses were grunts and belches. These noises might nonetheless be signs of Ogrin piety. The lone tech priest, head bowed devoutly, smiled sympathetically. The engines of human loyalty were beginning to whine and its hull to wail. The cruiser was at last descending through the moon's atmosphere. 
concluding with a final resounding imperator benedict. Sir Pillion fled to his cabin and stripped off his chaplain's vestments. Activating the view screen in its wrought iron frame of death's heads and scorpions, he stared at the flickering, swelling vista of Urpal City below. The spaceport was a flat grey metal pitted with blast pads. Spires sprouted like thickly waxed hairs. Suburbs were stubble. Roads were wrinkled, zigzagging away into the sallow, lumpy skin of the landscape. A snaking blue vein was a river. A lake was a hemorrhage. Farms were bruises. He knelt and thought, I am a strange flower growing somewhere in that land. My lurid secret petals are ears that hear voices on the psychic winds. My pollen smells luscious to parasites. He too had once been a strange flower, had he not? Born into the salubrious upper tiers of the hive city of Magnox on Denebola V, young Tork had been torn between a taste for learning and a sensual nature. Both, of course, were facets of the search for new experiences. Yet whereas a youth who seeks solely for madder music, stronger wine, stranger drugs, wilder girls, and for the thrill of danger, may presently become a poet or a master criminal, or some such deviant, he is much more likely to burn out, to ruin his adolescent course and to settle thereafter into self-indulging conformity. Whereas a studious youth may develop into a useful, even a brilliant, drudge. Put the two together in one skin, though. Talk's father was a chamberlain to one of the noble houses of Magnox. So, naturally, soon after puberty, Talk had joined one of the fashionable and privileged brat gangs who rampaged and rousted in the latest glitter garb costumes, sporting black codpieces, grotesque jewellery, and plumed helmets fitted with crash music earphones who wounded and slew with power stilettos which would spring a spike of vibrating, searing energy into the guts of a rival. One night, during a raid on the lower tech levels of Magnox, Tork sensed for the first time the presence of Ambush. A glowing, multidimensional map of human life signs swam within his head, distorting, shot through with static, needing tuning. Subsequently, in that mysterious, multiviolent map, he was to his sense the eerie mauve glow of intrusion from the warp. He led the Brack gang against a nest of psychers. These psychers were on the verge of being possessed by demons. A rival gang were protecting them, and were making a playful, erotic cult of them. Had Talk's gang discovered those psychers first, events might have fallen out otherwise. Avid for frills, the gilded youths from the upper tier might have made gang mascots of the psychers. Tork might have become a coven leader. Eventually pursued by fervent witch-finders, he might have been forced to flee and hide among the scum of the Undercity. Yet, events did not fall out in this fashion. Furthermore, Tork had studied and he knew the lineaments of the Imperium rather better than his fellow brats. He thought he understood the strength of its muscles and the way those muscles pulled. His gang bested the patrons of those psychers, who had been pampered and abused by turns. Along with those captured playthings, he presented himself to the ecclesiarchy as a would-be inquisitor, whereby he would enjoy the wildest experiences within a learned framework. He hadn't, by any means, relished all of his subsequent experiences, and sometimes he was dogged by doubt that he was betraying kin of his mind albeit out of a dire necessity that became increasingly clear to him during his years of training. Piety had become his prophylactic against twinges of remorse. Faith was his pain-soothing pill, his vindication. Talk still dressed as a dandy, one devoted to terrible duties, and his superiors had smiled in their thin, astringent way at such evidence of honourable excess. "'I am a flower, a flower,' he droned, breathing in trance rhythm. Talk had been somewhat of an orchid, to begin with, whereas the boy he sought was a wonderful weed infesting some fly-blown farm. Could he identify? A mauve glow polluted his inner map every which way, refusing to condense into a single signalling spot. That glow masked the brash, young hues of the flower. A fortified palace stabbed upwards, tilted by the angle of the ship's approach. Towers 
spiked domes, laser batteries, of a chateau within wall gardens drifted by, factories, abattoirs, then a plain of farrow concrete loomed. Human loyalty settled, the familiar throb of engines faded, a klaxon shrieked to signal the shutting down of artificial gravity, as the natural pull of the moon, which was a good twenty percent weaker, replaced the generated gravity. So the ship creaked. The cruiser was at once relaxing and bearing down. An inquisitor must bear down firmly without such inner relaxation. The gravity of his mission was, perhaps, extreme. I'm r really deeply honoured, stammered Reverend Henrik Farb. I never set eyes on a space marine before, let alone met a commander. And why should he have? If the Imperium comprised a million worlds, why, there were only a million marines too. Musky incense snaked inside the cavernous temple, wreathing icons and writing curlicures upon the air, in what might have been the mad script of aliens. Fab, sweating, sucked in tendrils of that smoke like an asthmatic seeking soothing vapours to assuage a panic-stricken attack of suffocation. Candles flickered, contributing their own fainter odour of reptile grease. This man, who had presumably terrified so many others, was terrified himself. Your respect honours our emperor, said Hackard. So does your dread. But now you must think clearly. The Inquisitor had finally narrowed the likely area of search to a quadrant north of Erpal City. The land raiders that survived after Valhal too had sped forth on their cleated armoured tracks to the various towns in this zone, crushing the primitive roads, carrying marines and ogrins. And it so happened that Hackard himself had come to this town of Groxgelt, if there was to be action, he wished to be as close as possible, not back at the ship awaiting reconnaissance reports. How could he put this worthy preacher at ease? Tell me, he asked lightly. What does Gelt in Groxgeld refer to, cash or to castration? Fab stared at his questioner, as if he were being posed a riddle upon which his life depended. Could it be, wondered Hackard? that the preacher didn't understand all of his words. The man spoke decent imperial gothic, but the dialect used on this moon was quite comprehensible. Never mind, preacher. Tell me this. What lad in this community stands out in any way different? Farb's gaze dropped to the grief-bringer's protruding groin guard of a verdigree smeared skull transfixed by a purple dagger. Castration, I think, he mumbled. Concentrate, snapped Hackard. Yes, yes, th there's one boy, never caused any bother, praise in the temple here, good worker, so I hear. Fab licked his fat lips. Attends witch breakings, though they seem to make him squirm. Son of the tanner, Jabal. The boy has no visible deformities, that's the odd thing about him. He looks, and the preacher spat, so pure. Lately he has been going places alone, I hear. How do you come by that information? The wife of the farmer who employs him. I, well, I, I cherish certain feelings for that woman, between you and me, as man to man. Hackard forbore to sneer at this attempted comparison. Nothing can listen to on my part, sir. She's... A woman of substance, if you take my meaning. Perhaps if her husband is ever gored by a grox. What of the boy? Why, Galandre Pusher keeps her eye on him as a good employer should. The boy speaks differently. His tone seems less local. He uses the odd word she does not understand. As the Griefbringer strode back to the land raider after interrogating the terrified Tanner and good wife Jabal, who made a better showing, and the hulking's stupid son, Big Ven, he eyed the Ogryn Bonehead and the tech priest sitting on the uppermost track of the vehicle. Zigzags of pea green and purple blotched the plasteel body and the track walls, 
Mounted with last cannon ball turrets of the Land Raider, less suggestive of camouflage than of a sickly infection by some poisonous lichen, a cowed crowd of townsfolk were eyeing those who perched high upon the massive vehicle. The sprocketed wheels that moved the tracks were hidden from their superstitious gaze by the casings of armour. For his men to have to mix with these scratching, farting, dumb-witted, sweating peasants, to have to try to tease some sense of backyard gossip after the costly victory over the enslavers, a perilous task that had almost proved beyond the grief-bringer's reach, this present mission almost seemed designed as an insult, a reproof for losing so many comrades, however gloriously. No, thought Hackard, that way heresy lies. I must trust the instincts of an inquisitor. At least the fat preacher had understood well enough the power that Hackard and his men deployed, and the seriousness of the threat to humanity that must have brought such warriors here. Hackard was fairly sure that he had located the prey they sought, while the Inquisitor remained unable to pinpoint him. The commander permitted himself a slight, black-toothed smile, not of superiority, but of grim satisfaction. His return to the market square triggered a flurry in the gawping, fearful, and stupidly resentful crowd, yet most gazes flickered back quickly to the crudely clad Ogryn, stood atop the vehicle. The citizens of Groxgel could see that the bulky grief-bringer with the visor of his helmet raised, was a true man. Did that passive mob of ugly specimens view the bonehead as more intimidating than an armoured space marine? Or, in their squinty eyes, was the grotesque, prognothius Ogryn someone to whom they could more easily relate? Hackard entered the hatch of the personal den, where tech crew and other marines waited. The comnet crackled alive as he fingered its rune knobs, its spirit kindling faithfully. Lord Inquisitor, he reported, I have identified possible suspect, name of Jomi Jabal. Curfew approaches, but boy has not returned home. Believed to be out by farm four kilometres northwest of Groxgeld town. One boy. Against whom land raiders, las cannons, armoured grief bringers and ogrins. One boy. Plus, what else? I'm within twenty kilometres of you, Commander. I'm on way. Don't let the noise of the land raider alert our target. Advance the final four kilometres on foot. Understood. Haggard switched automatically to battle code to summon the other land raiders to rendezvous at speed across country, just outside of Roxgelt. He would have to wait a while, so he stepped outside again. The setting gas giant peered over rooftops like the disembodied eye of some enormous cosmic parent creature, which was slowly withdrawing its witness from this world so as to allow a cloak of gloom to descend. This land raider, the armor's cracked, needs welding. You're a tech priest. Paint another rune, utter another charm. Grill muttered an unintelligible response from under the folds of his hood, triggering a brief flare of annoyance in Hackard. At a time when he should be composing himself reverently for combat, he glared at the tech priest. Silence! In any case, we shall be advancing on foot to begin with. Thunderjug guffawed, like distant thunder. Soon, the voice soothed Jummy. Welcome the circle into your mind. The voice had told him where to wait by the biggest Grox paddock. Jomi glanced anxiously at the sinking gas giant. Already the last of the gloaming was upon the countryside. Soon the curfew trumpet would scream out in town and no one human would be abroad but himself. He would have broken the law. If the owner of the voice did not come, what could Jomi do? Hide till morning? What, here where mutants might roam? for if muties did not enter the town itself, they might well haunt the open countryside. Yet he was a mutant too. Why should other mutants be hostile to one of their own kind? Ah, but outcasts would surely be hungry. Jommy's flesh might smell sweet. Sweet flesh reminded him of Gretchy. If nothing else happened tonight, he could stumble to the farmhouse. He might be able to climb to an upper window, Gretchy's, and tap for admittance. 
Surely she would admire his daring in venturing out at night to see her. Surely she would reward him suitably. He ached to cup those white doves in his hands and to explore her private nest of hidden hair, which itself hid the circle. Think of that, or I may lose focus. He thought of Gretchy's mouth open wide. He thought of another part of her opening to him, a soft ring, of whose exact shape and dimensions he wasn't quite sure. <laughs> Forget that, foolish minx. She's worthless. I can let you glimpse such lust nymphs as will make her seem trite and dowdy. I can conjure ludicrous courtesans from memory. Ay, such a pang of anguish and frustration seemed to afflict the voice. Glimpsing and conjuring. The voice had promised to introduce Jomi to the lights, not merely show him, as if spied through a window of thick glass. You'll be broken on the wheel if I don't reach you, the voice threatened. The wheel. Jomi jerked back to reality. What else was his whole life on this damned moon but wretchedness? Intrails and heat and fear and Galandra Pushak's lusts, which she would insist on satisfying one day soon, crushingly and disgustingly. He was about to leave all this vileness behind. Don't think of Gretchy again until after the owner of the voice arrives. He forced her image from his mind. Wheel, circle, circle, wheel. In the last golden light, the horned, scaly, toothsome reptiles milled sluggishly in their corral. Each was the size of a small pony. Their claws clicked on the stony ground. Cropland dipped away towards the river. Boulders... Some the size of houses punctuated the ridged oat fields, carried here by sheets of ice long ago, the voice had told him. Jummy inhaled. He thought he heard whispers on the wind. He sensed minds, disciplined minds, almost completely shielded from him as if a fire screen stood in front of a blaze of grox dung. Yet some of the heat glowed through. Could witches, who were far cleverer than himself, be creeping towards this place, attracted by the voice? No witches who had been broken in the square had ever seemed particularly clever. Of course, extreme pain reduced them to imbecility, to shattered bags of white-hot, shrieking nerves, and little more than that. Could they ever have been clever to be captured? Compared with those wretches, Jommy had become educated, somewhat. Maybe really clever witches had escaped and banded together in the furthest hinterlands far from farms and towns. Thus it had taken them months to trek here. Jommy could also sense other minds nearby that were dull and slow and fierce. Was he hearing the thoughts of the Groxon too? Surely not. Voice, he questioned. Hush, bonny boy, I must concentrate. Oh, it has been so long. Soon I will embrace you. Strive to see the circle in front of you. He mustn't fail the voice at the last moment, for thus he would fail himself. Nor must he scare it away by hinting at the presence of those other strange minds in the vicinity, those and the brutish minds. Obediently, he imagined a circle and strained his eyes in the dimming light. Yes, a glowing hoop appeared, balanced on the ground a few hundred metres away. Slowly it swelled in size, though it did not brighten. If anything, it grew dimmer as though to evade scrutiny from elsewhere. Within the hoop was utter night, a darkness absolute. The fact that the portal was coming into existence some distance away from the boy, and slowly, tended to rule out the activity of a warp creature. Warp creatures were usually impetuous in their attack. Nor could the alien Eldar be creating this opening. The Eldar were masters of warp gates and such. They hardly needed the type of psychic focus that the boy seemed to be providing. As though anything on this moon could possibly interest the Eldar. This portal was opening almost painfully, if such a thing could be. Almost creakingly, as if its hinges had rusted during long eons of time. Obviously a warp portal didn't have hinges, but the analogy held. Griefbringers in power armour were spreading out under the cover of the boulders, a gang of Ogrins was lumbering into position in the almost darkness. If we seize the Psyker boy now, began Hackard, tentatively. We may scare whatever is coming. We must wait till the portal maker steps through. 
We hunt for knowledge as well as prey. Knowledge? Did the commander shudder? In the Dark Age, he murmured. They sought knowledge for its own sake. Sir Pillion said sharply, Only the Emperor knows what really happened during the Dark Age. How the Inquisitor wished that he knew too. Godless science had flourished back then. From time to time, remnants were still found. Precious, arcane techniques and equipment of utmost value to the Imperium. Long ago, the human race had spread through the galaxy like a migration of lemmings, heedless of the beings lurking in the warp, for it was heedless of its own psychic potential. Innocence, innocence. Puppies in a demon's den. Like a sudden storm, insanity and anarchy had erupted till the god-emperor arose to save and unify, to control the human worlds, to calm the psychic tempest with utmost and essential rigour. Here was a boy of the possible future to be. Here was. What else? Sir Pillion extended his sense of presence, but mauve distortions dazed his vision. A robot, higher than any building in Groxgelt. A robot that bristled with what Jomi took to be weapons lurched through the gate of darkness. Here I am, dearest boy, exulted the voice in Jomi's brain. Don't fear this metal body. This is the shell that has sheltered the kernel of myself while I drifted alone for eons in the warp in a derelict hulk. Now at last I can touch the soil of a world. Now I can hope to be a fleshly body once more. Oh, the sweet, endearing flesh. The senses that sing, the nerves that twang like harp strings. And what song did they sing so long ago? Soon I shall remember. The robot took a tentative step towards Jommy, as if exercising limbs which hadn't encountered the pull of gravity for many millennia. The robot swept an arm around. Energies crackled from the tips of its steel fingers, gusting across the herd of Groxen. The reptiles began to snort and hiss and rip at the soil of their compound and put their horns against the fence. What fleshly body was the kernel of this huge machine hoping to be? As the juggernaut took another lurching step in Jommy's direction, he began to sweat. He crouched. Sir Pillion shook the bag of rune bones at his waist, so that he sounded like an angry rattlesnake, then switched on his energy armour. Beneath his cloak, subtle forces wove a cocoon that clad his body, and his cuirass glowed faintly. He too now heard that voice inside his own head, and shivered at the treachery which the ancient survivor must intend. It was hoping to seize control of the boy's brain and body, dispossessing his spirit, casting it into the limbo of the Sea of Souls. The Inquisitor stared at the giant gunmetal grey relic, trying in vain to classify it. It was squatter than a battle titan, its limbs less flexibly jointed. Nor did any obvious head protrude from the top of its chest in the way that control heads jutted, turtle-like, from titans. However, it looked almost as formidable. And what was more, it housed someone who had endured literally for eons. Sir Pillion knew of no mechanical system other than the Emperor's enormous immobile prosthetic throne, which could sustain a person's existence for such a long time. What remnant of flesh and bone could possibly lurk inside that mobile juggernaut? Only the head and spinal columns of the castaway. Only the naked brain bathed in fluids. Or maybe, could such a thing be? Only the mind itself, wrought within some intricate interior talisman by ancient eldritch sorcery. That robot was a treasure. Its occupant hoped to steal a human brain which housed such great psychic potential to add to its own psychic powers. Whosoever controlled such a boy? Sir Pillion suppressed within himself a tenorous twinge of treacherous ambition. Was he being corrupted by proximity to this monster from the past? "'Tis ever this way,' Hackard commented grimly. "'A thin line confronts the foulest enemies. Yet thank him on earth. That line is stronger than a diamond forged in a supernova. Permission,' he requested, "'to summon the land raiders. "'Yes,' Do so, but only as a reserve. I don't wish the robot destroyed utterly. Hackard radioed in battle code. As the two men stood under a sheaf of stars, a voice called out, Sir. It was the tech priest, accompanied by the Ogren Bonehead. Surely that's a robot from the early age of strife. 
The portal must lead to a space hulk in the warp. Where else could such a robot have lurked? That hulk could contain a wealth of ancient technology. Yes, agreed Sir Pillion. I do believe that's so. At that moment, the curfew trumpet shrieked from afar, as if that toxin were the signal for battle. Commander, disable the robot, shoot off its legs. Hackard rapped out orders. Almost immediately, plasma and laser beams stitched the deepening night. Yet the beams glanced away, deflected by some shield, or even by an aura of invulnerability. For the mind within that machine was potent, was it not? Had it not had mad, lonely eons, during which to examine and hone its powers. The robot's own inbuilt lasers and plasma cannon fired back, tracking the sources of the energy beams. At the same time, a wave of confusion lapped at Sir Pillion's mind. The creature in the robot possessed psychic weaponry too, so it seemed. Perhaps something else shared mind space with the occupant of that plasteel refuge, something that one wouldn't exactly classify as human company. Sir Pillion had seen to it that the Griefbringers wore protective psychic hoods. Still in that first onslaught, two marines broke cover, impetuously, rushing directly towards the robot. Their suits glowed, then incandized. The overload filter in Hackard's radio stole away their screams. Another brave man took advantage of the diversion to advance at a powered run from a different direction, clutching a melter bomb. He was obviously hoping to sacrifice himself by detonating this against one of the robot's feet, thus destabilising it. Plasma engulfed him. The night erupted briefly as the bomb's thermal energy gushed prematurely, liquefying his suit. The space marines quickly resumed more disciplined fire. As Sir Pillion squinted at the flaring, stroboscopic scene, he could tell that the robot had halted, though it showed precious little sign of disablement. Beam simply slid off it, bouncing away into the sky. A grim hill hove into view, then another. Land raiders arriving on station, said Hackard. If we aim their las cannons at one leg in concert, we should bring it crashing down soon enough. What if the shielding and the aura hold, even temporarily? Fierce energies will recoil unpredictably. The boy may be evaporated in the backlash. If the last cannon beams do break through, the robot might explode. Couldn't Hackard guess at the value of this artifact from elder days? Maybe not. He only saw a present menace to the Imperium. Of all those present, save for Sir Pillion, perhaps only the tech priest realised. The Inquisitor could hardly confide in him. Indeed, he might need to silence the man. Once again, Sir Pillion felt a thread of heretical temptation insinuating itself within his soul and muttered a prayer. Asperge me, God Emperor, cleanse me. Permission, sir, requested the Sergeant Ogryn. My men, strong, we charge at robot, wrestle it onto its side. Hackard laughed, and it occurred to Sir Pillion that the wave of confusion might have affected the minds of the Ogryns peculiarly. Unlike the Space Marines, the Ab humans had been shielded only by their own dense skulls and by their brutish, if violent, thought processes. The confusion might only now be surfacing in their brainiest representative, the sergeant. Why not? said the commander. Listen carefully, sergeant. Send all your ogrins round to the north side. Yes, in that direction, over there. Then you come back to report. As soon as the marines cease fire, your ogrins must charge. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Thunderjug stomped over to his troopers and bellowed at them for a while. Couldn't one of them scoop up the boy? suggested Grill. They'd probably tear his head off by mistake, snapped Hackard. Um, Commander, sir. What is it now, Grill? Isn't a charge by Ogrins a might uh, suicidal? Not necessarily, intervened Sir Pillion. The robot replied to fire with fire, but the Ogrin charge might confuse it. I take it that that's the commander's intention, rather than him implying that his hands are being tied. Hmm, said Grill. Thunderjug returned and stood to attention. Jomi clung to the ground in terror as the air blistered above him. They'll need to change their tactics, advised the voice. A lull must come, and I think I can cause a diversion. When I say run, sprint to me as fast as you can, ducking low. I can take you inside this body. I can transport you back through the portal. 
Better the warp than death, don't you think? The sizzle of lethal beams almost convinced Jummy. Almost. I'll save you, Jummy. Save you. I am your safety. The voice began to drone hypnotically, bewitchingly. It promised lusts, fulfilments, yet seemed savagely bewildered as to what these might be. Did Jummy hear a background hint of crazed laughter? His body twitched, puppet-like. He threw up his hands reflexively, and a low, stray laser beam seared his wrist superficially. The pain jerked him free from the growing enchantment, plunging him again into a terrain of terrible fear. "'Are you man or woman?' he gasped. "'I hardly remember.' "'How can you not remember such a thing?' It became unimportant, yet a ghost reminds me of the flesh, a goading wrath within. Ah, Jomi, Jomi! I know so much, and I am so separated from all that I knew. My ghost cries for a body to caress and sculpt to its desire. Come to me soon, Jomi, when I call. From the voice's moaning words, Sir Pillion gathered ample confirmation that its owner had been a psychic eavesdropper, a millennia of war-torn history, and even of hidden pre-Imperium history. How the Inquisitor thirsted for its knowledge. But the ancient survivor was also, he strongly suspected, possessed. Possessed by a demon of the warp. This was an unusual species of possession, for the survivor plainly owned no body at all, other than the vast metal body of the robot. The survivor consisted only of mind, wrought within a talisman of crystal wafers or some other occult material. A talisman which strove to maintain the stability of its mind, strove with a fair degree of success, considering the awesome time span, yet of necessity imperfectly. The demon had no tangled flesh to twist and warp and stamp its mark upon. It could only lurk impotently, glued to the imprisoned mind, tormenting it spasmodically by stimulating memories and sensuous hallucinations. Maybe the goad of the demon was what had prevented the survivor from lapsing into sloth. The voice spoke of science. The truth was corruption. Conclusio. Its science was heresy. Sir Pelion must not first for that. And now that the castaway's dark scheme to possess Jomi had failed, a cursed demon-inspired plan, the survivor was intent on at least carrying the boy back into exile with it. At Hackard's command, the grief-bringers ceased fire. Just as the Ogren squad was commencing its assault, the robot aimed a plasma blast low at the Grox compound, crisping several beasts yet also tearing a long gap in the fence. Sir Pillion, sensed the aura of venomous intent which the mind and the robot, demon assisted, directed at the reptiles to stir their bloodlust. Rippling at one another, Groxen burst free of their captivity and rapidly were attracted towards the thundering giants. All plasma and laser fire had ceased. The psycho boy staggered erect and stumbled towards the robot, seeing which Sarpillion let out a cry of frustration. "'Catch that lad for the Emperor, Thunderjug!' shouted Grill, as if he was a commander. "'And don't pull his head off unless you have to!' No appeal could mean more to an Ogren. Tossing his encumbering ripper gun aside, Thunderjug Agrox barred his tusks and pounded towards the distant youth. The tech priest stumbled after it, doing his best to keep up, encumbered as he was by his heavy robes. Careless of his own safety, Sir Pelion, looped after it, blood-red cloak streaming, the very image of an avenging angel. The boy must be stopped. A hatch was opening in the lower casing of the robot to welcome the lurching youth. Just then, the stampeding Groxen met the charging Ogrens. The insensate animals leapt, clawed, bit and gouged. They tore chunks of flesh, yet an Ogren hardly heeded such trivia. Ogren fists smashed Grox skulls. However, the robot noticed the boy's pursuers and swivelled a weapon arm, opening fire with a raking of explosive bolts. Sir Pillion dived flat. Ahead of him, the Ogren's mighty legs pounded onwards for a dozen more strides before the giant crashed to the ground. The tech priest struggled past, his hood blown back by the wind, implant cables flapping. Then a blast grenade, launched from a tube in the robot's arm, exploded near him. The shockwave picked the priest up and threw him several metres. 
Sprawled on the stony dirt, Sir Pillion stretched out his right arm, forefinger pointing the Jacaro needler. One needle in the buoy, and he would be paralysed. The range was somewhat extreme for such a tiny, lightweight dart. The target was moving. The Inquisitor strove to aim. At that moment, when Jomi was barely twenty metres from the inviting hatch, he halted. A psychic maelstrom of savagery and pain whirled around Jomi. The death shrieks of those who had died, the berserker fury of Ogrens as they fought the reptiles, the terror of all the energy beams and explosions, these suddenly culminated. A lurid radiance seemed to flare in his mind as if doors were flying open, behind which fierce furnaces raged, cauldrons of inchoate energy. Jomi, you've almost reached me. Run just a little bit more and leap inside me. Looking up at the towering machine, Jomi suddenly perceived it, by that blazing light from within him, not as a mountain of metal in approximately humanoid shape, but as a vast, naked Galendra Pushik, looming over him lustfully. Her legs were squat trunks. The hatch was her secret opening. Her enormous torso, thick with fat, writhed with desire to entertain him. Her great, muscular arms reached out. Jomi, my dearest, delicious boy, my joy! What confronted him was a robot again, yet the light from within him did not cease. It changed hue and wavelength, so that he peered, appalled, into the world of what might be. Assisted by a tentacle, he had leapt into a womb of steel, a metal pod barely large enough to stand up in. The tentacle withdrew, and he was thrown upon the floor as the robot rocked, starting to march back towards the portal, brushing aside the brawling bodies of brutal ogrins and rabid groxen. Its cleated feet crushed deep craters. The hatch was descending to close him in. Through it, while still open, by the resuming spasming light of energy beams, Jomi glimpsed a man in glowing breastplate and blood-red cloak, a thin, tall man, with a drooping black moustache and a staring eye tattooed upon his cheek, sprinting frantically towards the decamping robot. Jomi could hear the man's thumping thoughts. Even if I can paralyse him, too late to drag the boy out. At least cling to some handheld on the robot. Don't lose it entirely or all has been in vain. Accompany it willy-nilly through the doorway of darkness. Will there be air on the other side of the portal? Will all atmosphere have long since leaked out of the hulk? Will there only be vacuum to boil my blood and collapse my lungs like empty paper bags? My energy armour will be no protection from that fate. The hatch closed, plunging Jomi into utter obscurity and silence. The body that carried him lurched and swayed. Presently, little lights winked on. Jomi hugged his own body protectively. How could he escape from this pod? Surely he couldn't live inside this miniature chamber, even if the machine fed him. He imagined the narrow floor, a swill with his urine, in which nuggets of excrement bobbed. Welcome to my kingdom, the voice purred. Bitter mockery tinged the accent Jomi heard in his mind. My kingdom, now. Mine too. A malicious, disappointed echo seemed to haunt the voice, perhaps unheard by it, perhaps all too familiar. Failure, feeble failure. But here's a soft body, at least. The lid of a small porthole slid aside. Jommy pressed his face to the thick plus crystal as floodlight beams lanced from the robot. He stared at a great grotto of metal, from which several steel tunnels ran away into Stygian gloom. Strange machines jutted from the plated floor and from the ribbed walls. A debris of loose tools and cargo floated like dead fish in a dank pond. There's one other such machine as mine on board, the voice confided, as if oblivious of the soft, sinister echo that Jomi had heard. It has been inactive for millennia, lacking a person's mind to fill it. But I can revive it now with my science. I'll put you into it. First, of course, I'll need to cut away your body. That'll be an exquisite hour or so. Jummy vomited in terror. Soon, before you use all the air I sucked in on that moon, 
Once you're activated, we can play games. Hide and seek, for instance. You'll need to rely on the resources of your lovely mind. At least I'll have company now. Oh, the madness, the madness. Maybe my imaginary companion will go away. Into you, maybe. A figure in a blood-red cloak drifted into view. Out in the giant grotto, its frozen arms stretched out vainly towards a vista which, prior to the flare of illumination, it couldn't possibly have seen. What might be, and might still be, vanished. Jomi still stood before the robot. Demon! Demon! Hidden demon! He shrieked at it. He spat, reaching into his memory for an incantation. He recalled Fab's prayers and howled, Imperator Humanorum Nostra Salvatio! Jomi, do not betray me! The white hot cauldron inside Jomi spilled over. The inner furnaces, so suddenly revealed to him, gushed psychic fire. Hardly knowing how, he sprayed a fountain of defensive mental energy, ill-focused yet incandescent at the voice, which would have betrayed him. Nostra salvatio, humanorum imperator! Ay! cried the voice, keening through his head like a scalpel blade, attempting to sever the sinews of his new-found psyker ability, raw and unshaped as yet. Recoiling, his brain in agony, Jomi nevertheless summoned another spout of hot repulsion to hurl at the robot. The boy's raw power, and his piety too, albeit born of terror, bathed in the backwash of inner light from the volcanic upheaval within the boy, with his own senses extended, Sir Pillion had partaken of Jomi's vision of what might be. As if an actor in Jomi's dream, the Inquisitor had experienced the death agony of passing through the portal, of collapsing lungs, of utter, absolute chill. He had also known Jomi's claustrophobic, dreadful dismay. Moments later, Sir Pillion found himself, still sprawled on the battlefield, and the battlefield was a blessed place by contrast. Scrambling up, Sir Pillion signalled back towards Hackard, hoping that the commander could see and would understand his gestures. Then he resumed his reckless run towards the boy, who was holding the robot at bay, like a rat defying a bull. He no longer pointed his Jacaro needler. Casting his own order of protection, Sir Pillion seized Jommy by the shoulders. In the Emperor's name, come with me to safety. Come swiftly, Jommy Jabal. Hackard must have understood, as soon as Sarpillion had hauled the boy to some reasonable remove and had ducked with him behind a boulder, the last cannons of the land raiders opened fire. Shaft upon shaft of searing energy lanced at the robot. The space marines added their contribution. Wounded Ogren scattered, abandoning the remaining Groxon which had been preoccupying them. Had the giants not engaged with the savage reptiles, by now one of those might have attacked Sir Pillion and the boy. The robot launched jets of plasma and energy beams. A land raider exploded, raining hot shards of plasteel. Several space marines fell victim to beams and jets. The imperial energies cascaded off the robot's shields, pluming into the sky, rendering the landscape bright as day. Yet now the robot seemed confused. It backed, it lumbered, perhaps the mind within was anguished, perhaps infected by Jommy's vision. It imagined that it had passed safely back through the portal, though the nightmare evidence was otherwise. Perhaps it was running low on energy. At last, an imperial energy beam tore loose a weapon arm. Another beam pierced the vulnerable hatch. Part of the robot's mantle flared and melted, still firing but falteringly now. Seemingly at random, the great damaged machine stomped back towards the portal. Land raider beams focused in unison upon its back, so that it seemed to be propelled in its retreat by a hurricane-torn white heart sail, woven from the heart of a sun. As it entered the portal, the robot incandized blindingly. A detonation, as of a dozen simultaneous sonic booms, rocked the torn terrain. Glaring fragments of the robot's carapace flew back like angry boomerangs, like scythes. The bulk of its disintegrating body pitched forward, out of existence, vanishing. Sir Pillion deactivated his energy armour 
and Jommy, smeared with dirt and stinking of sweat, wept in his arms. I shall, vowed Sir Pillion, recommend you for the finest training, as an inquisitor yourself. The boy cried. What? What I can't hear, only the awful, terrible thunder. Your hearing will return, Sir Pillion shouted into the boy's streaked face. If not, that can be repaired with an acoustic amulet. One day you will serve the Emperor as I serve him. I came a long way to find you. After a while, Jommy listened to Sir Pillion's thoughts instead and began to understand. This cloaked figure had come a long way to find him. Why? So had the voice. So had the mind and the demon in the robot. Jommy would be sent far away from the wretched moon, to terror itself. He thought fleetingly of Gretchi. But as the voice itself had suggested, that kind of yearning seemed to have become extremely insignificant. Groaning and rubbing his head, Grill wandered back to where the bonehead lay sprawled. But it was undeniable that Thunder Jug's whole skull, including the riveted battle honours, was missing. The tech priest touched the toppled giant reverently on the shoulder. Bilious hued power armour loomed. Commander Hackard himself stood over the Ogryn. I watched him charge, said Hackard's external speaker. The other subhumans remain alive, I think. So by and large, but not their sergeant. The Griefbringers are honoured by his bravery. Ponderously, the Space Marine commander saluted. What about me, thought Grill. I nearly got blown to pieces, but he said nothing. It was Thunderjug who was dead. Bending, assisted by the tech priest, Hakkar dragged the Ogren's corpse into his powered arms. As Grill gazed up at the indigo sky, the stars stared back down at him, blindly. The portal had disappeared a while since, yet a tremor seemed to twist the night air, warping the heavens. Or was the distortion due to moisture? in his eyes. Thanks for watching, everybody. Um, that was a weird one. Again, apologies for the uh, the sound quality. I'm hoping to have that resolved very, very soon. It's just uh, an ongoing issue at the second until I get these additional foamy things to add to the walls. It's like half done. <laughs> so I'm crouching down trying to make sure I'm getting as much of myself in the cocoon. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, Ian Watson's like a really weird author. Um, he was one of the first ever GW authors ever, you know, to write a lot of really, really old novels. Um, the Child of Chaos series, that sort of thing, uh, you know, Inquisitor Draco. He came up with, I mean, if anyone's like a sort of, you know, him and uh, William King, I'd, I'd say, are probably like the old school first generation 40k and fantasy writers. And they really did a great deal to set up that world and be the sort of foundation level. I know I've done a couple of other ones. Um, you know the a couple of the other old books before but um yeah yeah that these are sort of obviously things are not law accurate or at least if they are they've got the wrong names you know but it still sets the scene and these are like i say the sort of foundation stuff for 40k this is what other stuff was built on later i mean this story was probably written mid 90s i'm guessing you know what i mean it's 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 very old um, Ian Watson as well is I don't know he's he's got a he's got an interesting way of writing and he likes to slip in uh, the perverted stuff now and again uh, which is interesting <laughs> it, it's just funny when I'm reading this stuff and I'm like most of the stuff I read I either read it um, sort of I, I might not read the whole thing I might just skim over it and just see what characters are in there and how to you know the vibe of the story what it, what it's actually aiming towards being the story um, or it's stories I know that I've read years and years ago, so I've got a rough idea of what it is and what characters are in it. So I don't necessarily read it all word for word before I do the, the reading here. So when I come across <laughs> stuff that just makes me go, what the fuck, man? I try and avoid it because it happens a fair amount, especially with these really old ones. Um, there's like weird, weird shit in them. <laughs> they can't help themselves, you know? But um, yeah, so apologies if uh, if that's distracting, but it's just fucking weird sometimes. <laughs> but Ian Watson's notorious for this. Uh, you know, uh, the book he wrote, Space... Is it called Space Marine? I think it might be about uh, the Imperial Fists and the Pain Glove and all that shit, man. Uh, well, you know, the, the dude is uh, he's an interesting character and he's done some interesting work at uh, 
setting out the uh, the foundation stones for the grim dark. And it's you know it is aside from that, like he, he does he does do a really good job of creating this world, um, adding to it on sort of a fundamental level, which wasn't there before. So you know I like it. I like him. You know even if some of it might be a bit ropey sometimes, I think he's uh, he's very capable still, and he's. And, you know, you need to understand this stuff. If you're going to understand 40K, you got to know this stuff. Anyway, I'm just ranting now. Thanks to everybody supporting the channel. You can see your names here. Um, if your name isn't here, it will be in the next one. Thank you to everybody. There's been, a you know, an upsurge in people supporting recently, and I appreciate that. It really, really, really helps. Um, and if you'd like to join them, you can use the links below or become a YouTube member. Um, I think there's some something about... I think people in the UK and New Zealand and some other countries, they get, like, a free... You know, like they do on Twitch with Amazon, you get like a free subscribe thing. So if you've got the free subscribe thing, feel free to uh, toss that my way. I'd appreciate it. <laughs> All right, no more begging. I'll see you later. Thanks very much. I'll be back with more stuff soon. And uh, yeah, apologies for the sound quality. It will re be resolved shortly. Uh, it's just uh, an annoyance that I've got to get past at the second. But it'll sound great after that. All right, see you later. Bye-bye.